Welcome everyone. I am absolutely delighted to say that I am joined by two-time Olympic gold medalist and two-time WNBA All-Star Ruthie Bolton. Ruthie, how are you keeping? I am wonderful. Hey, you know what? I, I feel great. I feel great. I get to see you and meet you for the first time. And 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 you look so young, like your generation, <laughs> y'all are just on fire, man. I'm telling you, but I am excited. I'm excited to be here, especially anytime we're gonna talk about girls. Hey, you know, that's that's my that's my kind of party. Oh man, and sorry, just to point out, you look so young. Like you look amazing. Oh, for real? Okay. Well, you know what? I my, I'm transitioning a new hairstyle and it is taking courage for me with my hair because I'm trying to go natural. And I look at people either like it or say, are you going to fix your hair? The people on the West no. Coast love my hair, but back in Mississippi, they were like, serious? Are you going to go out looking like that? So somewhere. No, I'm like, you look great. You got to trust you. got to go with me through the process. You know, you got you know, you to walk with me through this journey. So. Absolutely. And come here, how is life these days? How is COVID treating you? How is that all going? Uh, you know, I am in Mississippi with my kid, kiddos. I have an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old. And, you know, I am just, I have had to pivot in a way where, because the COVID, the, the chaos of this year, if you tell yourself that it's a bad year, it's going to be a bad year. If you tell yourself things will never be the same, things will never be the same. But if you tell yourself, in spite of what's happening, I'm going to find a way to still be productive. I'm going to find a way to still plant seeds and so that, and, and, and for one, being gratitude. And I'm thankful and I know there's, a, you know, my job is public speaking, going out, and that's how I make, that's my money maker. And a lot of those things were cut off. But I found myself like, oh my God, every day I'm getting emails, or this is council, this has got rescheduled. But I stopped worrying about that about, it started like in September. I literally, in Mississippi, I went where I was in a car accident 37 years ago. And I'm not trying to sound religious or all that, but I, but, but God spared my life in an accident. I, don't, I was thrown out of a car. I should have been, I should have left this world, but he saw fit for me to survive. And from there, I played professional basketball 15 years. I did all these things. Yeah. Olympic. I said, I have no room to complain. So, so gratitude is my word. And people say gratitude in 2020. Yes, gratitude, because I'm thankful. Every day I wake up with a heartbeat, I'm good. Yeah. Well, Ruthie, we're going to talk about attitude a little bit later in the interview. But first, I want to take it right back to when you were a child. Tell me about your childhood, your family, your one of 20 siblings. Tell me about what it was like growing up in Mississippi. Uh, 20 kids, 12 girls, eight boys. And I might add that I'm, I have a twin brother. And I was, I'm a minute older than he is. And I, I love to, uh, to share that. But I grew you have up to get that in there. I had to get that in there. My dad was a minister, so I'm a PK preacher's kid, and I grew up uh, just in a very strict household. My dad was big on going to church, discipline, attitude. And I mean, think that three things he taught us about faith, attitude, which I know we'll talk about later, and uh, yeah. character. Which so is three things we're going to talk about later. Go on. <laughs> your character and what you do. So my dad, to me, worked on those foundations, worked on those foundations, and and I was this little nappy hair girl. Didn't know whether I was coming or going. And I literally, my battleground was our backyard. I didn't know anything about what I would eventually become. I didn't know anything about the Olympics, about nothing. I was just this little girl growing up, just worried about every day. And I, you know what? I hated when it was nighttime. I hated to go inside. I don't know why I felt like this was going to be the last day of my life. And it was so weird. I felt I would get sad when it started to get dark. I'm like, I want to date because I was a serious tumble and I played outside. So, so growing up in my family with eight brothers and 11 sisters, it was fun. But I was always trying to be, I was, I was trying to stand out in a way where, because I was quiet. I was trying to stand out in my strength and my speed and my, and my, but I, because I couldn't, I felt like, seriously, I felt like I wasn't pretty enough. I felt like I was just like, I didn't, and I was so, I was an insecure little girl. But what made me strong in the meantime was I was physically strong. I could, I could climb tree, jump fences, and that was my, that was my thing. So I used my physical strength until I could get, until I could get where I was confident. And speaking of fences, Ruthie, um, I wanted to ask, was there any defining moments when you were younger that made you the person you are today? In particular, yes. the fence story that I've heard you talking about before. I'm in, I'm in North Dakota, and I'm like a new native. The natives have adopted me, and I, this is my here right here they are my new family love the native community i come here i've been coming here for the last two and a half years and i was speaking to a group of 
uh, athletes last night and I shared a fence story. I said, I would be remiss if I didn't share that fence story because I want them to know that they're on the other side of fear, there's, there's faith. And I said, on the other side of this pandemic, there's something great. You got to see beyond the obstacles. So I'm going to share the fence story real quick. Growing up in, uh, we live on about 10 acres. And as, and I had jumped that fence before, but this one particular day, as I was running to jump the fence, all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, the fence and I got higher. And I'm thinking like, oh, I know I was here. Hey, why can't I jump this fence? So I'm like, let me just take it off. I got this. So I attempted to try to jump the fence again. And it seemed like I couldn't. The fence was like getting tall. I'm like, oh, what is going on? And it was devastating to me because I couldn't jump that fence. I felt like that. I could have just, because they were leaving me. My cousin, my yeah. brothers, I said, like, come on. They were waiting for me to come. And I could have just went out the gate and went where they were. But it was something about, I felt like that fence was blocking me from that future. Like I was just like, I don't know. I got to get over this fence. Okay. I plundered with that fence for about 15 minutes. The street light came on. And guess what that meant in the house? <laughs> that we had five minutes to be in the house. And I'm thinking like, oh my goodness. And I'm sitting there. I couldn't even. I wasn't even hungry for the red beans and rice and cornbread. I didn't want to eat. They said, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I got to jump over that fence. That's what I was like. They was like, it's no big deal. We know you can do it. Just, just throw it where we left off yesterday. I said, no, I got to do it. The next morning I got up. I'm like, I know I could do it. Ruthie, just see beyond the fence. The obstacle, see yourself on the other side. I got this. Took a deep breath. And as I started to run, I said, you got this. Put everything you got. And I put everything I had. I leap high over the fence. I didn't quite land on my feet, but I landed. And listen, I celebrated that moment. Wow, I just cleared the fence. And what helped me clear that fence, clear the fence was I started seeing on the other side. The fence, I, I forgot about the fence. And sometimes in life, the obstacle in a way we can't see on the other side because we focus so much on the obstacle. When I started mm -hmm. seeing myself on the other side, seeing myself celebrate, that's when I started to get over. And guess what? I was about 14 years old. This is the significance of the story is that I didn't know anything about the Olympics. I didn't know anything about Hall of Famers, professional basketball, but that's the moment I embraced my Olympic journey. That's the moment I embraced being a Hall of Famer. That's the moment I embraced becoming a world champion because it was something inside of me that dug deep enough to take me on the other side. And that's why I share with young people. That's why I shared with the athletes last night is that look beyond the obstacle. There is something inside of you that is waiting to explore. There's something inside of you waiting for you to spread your wings. And that moment really changed my life forever. Because I think about had I not done that, it would have been easier for me to quit and walk away from other things. But that mm -hmm. moment period in my life. And so with that said, you got to trust the process. And I told them, I said, what you're doing now, if you fall flat on your face, get back up. But what you're doing now is going to define you. But please don't let fear paralyze you from going to the other side. That's so amazing. Like, I think there's a lot of kids that can really relate to that. And adults, to be fair, right there. And Ruthie, were you always a goal setter? Like when you were 14 with the fence, that was an example of it. But did you say, right, okay, now what do I want from life? Like how important is it for young people to set goals, do you think? It's, you know, goals can be a tricky thing. You mm. set these goals and you set um, realistic goals. You set these goals that, that for example, I want to, you know, I want to do, I want to jump 10 fences. You got to jump one first. And I'm going to yeah. give you an example is that when I when I eventually start playing basketball, you know, I, I you know, if we got 10 suicides or 10 sprints, if I think about all of those sprints at one time, it is overwhelming. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna focus on one. For as I can, I'm concerned I got one sprint. And I'm gonna focus on that one sprint. I'm gonna put everything I got in that one sprint. And then after that, and I worry about number two. So sometimes we get overwhelmed with just the big, like you, it's a saying, you can't eat the elephant all in one bite. You have to, yeah, you have to uh, chip away at it a little at a time. Yep. You eat elephants? I don't know if I should say that. But anyway, uh, you got to chip away at it. <laughs> but I think this new generation, I think they need to take small goals. They need to go small and just say, what can I, how can I be the better version of me today? Yeah. Like to be tomorrow. And that's every day I get up, what can I be better today than I than I was the day before? And so to me, that's what it comes to goal setting. Don't get so caught up in, you can think about down the road, yes, but take, but okay, yes, I want to be, uh, I want to be a basketball player. Okay, so now, Draw it back. Now, what is it going to take for me to be a basketball player? First of all, I got to set my mind is that I got to start practicing. I start working on this, working on that. Forget about, you know, all that, that long term, but you focus on the small because we lose, we forget about the task and young people in this new generation forget about the task. So focus on those small goals and then it's going to be the gateway for your uh, longer goals. Definitely. And I think nowadays as well, COVID will disappear and hopefully we're 
we're nearly there. But we need to take it day by day, I think, in anything in life, really, don't we? And at, at this point, sports people could really be honing in on their skills as well day by day. At the back, like you said, in your state, the tipping away at different skills. So it really is a day by day thing. Um, how was school for you, Ruthie? Were you, you said earlier you were quiet. Were you quiet in school? Did you just do your thing? Or You know what? I was quiet. And you know what's something my baby brother said about me in the documentary that they did on my family? He said, one thing about me, I wasn't a boastful. Like I would say, I, 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 I proved a lot by my action, by my, you know, by doing more push-ups, by climbing a tree faster, by sprinting. And if I did something spectacular, I didn't do it as a way of bragging and saying I'm better than you. I did it as a way of saying, you know, if I can do it, you can do it too. And yeah. I was like, oh, thank you, baby brother. But I think for us in school, I was quiet. My, they said my twin brother took all my words. I didn't like speaking, long speeches. I was so, I, I had an image of what, like, I didn't, I didn't know who I was, really. I think the things I did, I was just sort of trying to, I was trying to find myself. And But my father yeah. was, during that time, my father would say, you know what, it's what's inside that counts. It was since I got always complained about my hair. And back then I was playing, I was serious. I usually thought my skin was too dark. And I was just like, man, my sister that playing basketball, everything is going great for her. I felt like she was prettier than me. She had lighter skin. Her hair was prettier. She had, you know, she was taller. But in school, I was just this quiet person. But I I did my work. I was I was disciplined. And my my older sister tell me that I was a leader of my twin brother. She said, I'm not surprised you're doing what you're doing. She said, you were you would take up for him. If he got in trouble, you were like, oh, he didn't mean to. Or I would or I would tell him, hey, you got to get your shoes on. We're going to get in trouble. Like I was always trying to guide him. And she yeah. said, so I didn't, I didn't have a lot to say, but my actions as a quiet person, just like I was like loud, loud silence. My nieces have a Russian company now called Loud Silence. So I said, you know what? That sounds like me. It was like loud silence. That's unreal. And self-esteem then. How was that? So you were you were getting your schoolwork done, you were doing your training, and as you progress, you progress into an amazing career. How important is self-esteem and building that in others around you? You were keeping an eye on your brother, but what about everyone around you, like some people in school now who might see someone who needs a bit of a lift? Like, how important is that? It is so important. You know, I, basketball was also a, a gateway for me. Sports, finding something that you can shine and something, find something that you can say something without saying something. And so within myself, it's like, we all, there's something inside of us. We all want to be admired. We all want to be noticed. We all want to fit in. And basketball was a way that I could fit in, like sports. Like, wow, sport is a way that I can, people can notice me. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You want people to notice you to a certain level. You want someone to notice what you're doing, notice any type of, uh, create, find something positive in you. And so I think with this day and time, I always, when I go and I, and I share with you, a lot of young kids, I say, you know what? There's greatness inside of you. I'm here to remind you that there are greatness inside of you. And so surround yourself with people that's going to lift you up. If you got if those people that are toxic, bring you down, you really got to find new people. And so and if, if you got a strength to share and you see someone, and, and I, I was pretty good at doing it, even though I was quiet, I was pretty good at watching, observing people that, are you okay? You need it. And they was like, yeah. oh, thank you. Thank you for, and I, and I did that out of just sort of like, there was something I think just naturally built in me where that sort of that quiet leader. But I always was, I was also concerned about the morale of everybody. So so I think with this day and time, the ones that, if, if, if someone that need that support, need that, you sort of got to surround yourself with people that can build you up and so until you could tap into your own inner strength and, that, and tap into your own inner strength. And that's what I, is so important to me when I go and I speak to a group of young people, I say, you know what, there's strength inside of you. I said, there's nobody in the world like you. I said, your set of fingerprints. Nobody in the world, how yeah. unique is that? Nobody like you. So I remind them, say, you are unique. And I said, what if you knew you better? And that's what I shared with the kids last night. If you really knew that you matter. And they were like, wow. I said, because you do. But there's nobody in the world like you. Well, I think back then, your actions speak louder than words. But now, like, you are so inspiring. I'm sitting here and I'm like, yes, come on, Ruthie. Let's go do suicide this time. <laughs> um, What's your first memory of picking up a basketball? Uh, my first memory, growing up in a family of 20, picking up a basketball was, you know, we played in our backyard. You know, you know, you hear the story from every Southern athlete. Oh, it was a rim on the tree, but that's true. I, I got a picture of an ugly bicycle rim. That's what we played on, played which is shooting. So I picked up a basketball really, and that was a sport that we played. When you got a family of 20, what else you gonna do? You can't do a one-on-one -on -one sport. 
it got to be a team sport. So I was about eight or nine, and I really wasn't, I wasn't that good. Sometimes when I go and, I, and I'm like, wow, I became a rookie. And I'm like, and when I look, I was not really, you know, I tell myself I wasn't that good of a player. I said I had this fight and tenacity into me, and that's what really helped me. But basketball was something I gravitated towards. But guess what? Because I asked the kids, why do you play basketball? I said, you know what? And a lot of them say, oh, I play, I like it. Uh, I just like it. I don't know why I play. I said, I play because it is so rewarding. And guess what? You can shoot. If you miss, you can play defense. When you get back on offense, you can pass the ball. You can set a screen. It's so much you can do to make a, yeah. like you make a mistake. Like I'm a person, like I love, I like to be rewarded. I like to pick stuff fast. If I miss a shot, I'm like, I'm going to get back on defense. Now I'm going to let you score. Like I love to pick <laughs> stuff. I don't like to, and like when I hate, when I played and I messed up, I hate, I didn't like when coaches sat me down. I'm like, can you give me a chance to fix my mistakes? But basketball gives you that opportunity to correct yourself and different other things. So that's really why I love the game so much because of the competitiveness and you have the opportunity to really, a lot of um, uh, opportunities to really uh, gain your uh, strength and to reward yourself. Absolutely. And there's a lot of different positions as well. A lot of different players can play basketball, which I find is really, really good. And in terms of role models, Ruthie, back then, who did you look up to? I'm going to ask you later on who your leaders are now, but back then, did you have any role models? I looked up to my father, um, my dad, and, and I know that probably sounds like, okay, just, you know, it's, it, it should be. And maybe they think it should be athletes. And I, a lot of times, kids have asked who my role model. If I don't share the story, they say, oh, Michael Jordan, uh, Magic Johnson, or, or their name. I say, you know what? Those players were amazing. They were great. But now my role model, I got to see in my house every day. I grew up. He the one that encouraged me when I felt like giving up. He was the one that gave me a hug when I needed one. He was the one that was there for me and, and, and gave me and instilled this wisdom. You know, he would say something like, if you're taking life into just a few principles, you won't have to carry a suitcase full of rules. Yeah. He was the one that would say that life at 10% of what happens to you, but 9% how you respond to it. He was there. That was him. I, it wasn't some figure on television that I saw that I, I would never probably meet. It was someone that was there with me that whispered in my ear when that you are somebody that inspired. You don't have to look like your situation. That Don't let anyone take your power. So my dad was my role model because he was there when I needed him and he was right at my fingertips. It's amazing. I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. We're always looking for, oh, it's um, like Michelle Obama or it's all these different, LeBron James, but like it could actually be your mom or your dad. And that's amazing. So fair play. Um, I want to switch it up now, Ruthie, to yourself now and minding yourself and others. How do you look after yourself now daily in terms of exercise and food? Oof. And I do, you know, I, I try to do, I pray in the morning. I do self, I do meditation where I just really just try to do a self check every day. I, I almost like looking in a closet, looking to my chef and say, you know, what do I need to, what do I need to take off? An assessment. What do I need to put up there? And I try to do a self assessment every day. I don't want to ever get to a point. The moment you get to the point, the same as when you play the game, when you get to the point that you've arrived, that you're perfect, that everything is you ain't got. Then that's the that's the moment you feel. That's the moment things gonna creep in. You know, I think that's the thing that when the devil gonna creep in and make you think that you arrived, some things gonna come. So I try to stay humble at mm -hmm. circumstances. And so what I try to do is start the day off with a good mindset. Say, you know what? I choose what I'm going to be happy today. I choose where I'm going to have joy. I might not be happy with everything that happens, but I make a decision that this is going to be the best day of my life. I make a decision that what, I'm going to find a miracle today. There has to be a miracle, this little miracle every day. It, uh, it doesn't have to be something descending from the sky, bright lights or something major. To me, there are small miracles that I think we need to identify, and I do. And it thinks about, I think about my kids are healthy. I think I wake up, I say, you know what, I'm good. I'm a, I, I got my right mind. I know who I am. And to me, we, and, and, and your mindset is so important. And, and so that's what helps me get started. And then, of course, exercise. You know, I, I love exercise. I was just been asked once, I said, man, I should go out and run in the snow. It's this, you know, it's like 20 some degrees here. And I'm like, I got to get some exercise. If I don't go outside, I'm going to do some push ups, sit ups. But that keeps me accountable to me. It keeps me accountable to who I am. And so, and it keeps my mindset. And I, and I always, and I tell when I work out, I have to work out at least now one day a week, a two day a week. I work out sometimes four or five days in a row, but it has to be at least two days a row that I push myself to where when I'm working out, I feel like I want to quit. Because guess what? If you don't push yourself, if you don't challenge your mind and your body, 
if you don't if you don't feel like quitting something, you're not working hard enough. You leave a room, yeah. you are saving room, you are saving. But it's like if I feel like man, I feel like quitting, but the key is is not quitting. So I like yeah. I like to push myself to a certain extent from a physical standpoint, at least once a one day a week where it, I feel like I want to quit because it, it gets my heart rate up and it just really challenged me and it gives me this, it reminds me of the grit that I had when I played. And so those those definitely things. So praying, uh getting up and then and then exercising. And then also giving back. Like I, I, I try to do, I edify, I try to edify someone uh, every day. And at first I said every other day, but I try to edit someone, edify someone, whether I send a message or a quote or whether I call them and say, hey, you know, I'm just thinking yeah. about you. I said, I just encourage you. And most of the time, if it laid on my heart to do it, they was like, wow, how do you know? You know, so it's about yeah. trying to edify people and make them, because you never know, especially where everything's going on. And so I just try to, yeah. I just want to remind you of how much you mean to me. So edifying people is very important. It's very gratifying to me to be able to uplift someone and know that just by your voice or by your mere presence that you liberate people. Yeah, like Ruthie, there's so many things that you've said there that are just so true and there's nothing easy is worth doing. And you look phenomenal, so I don't believe you that you only work out two days a week. <laughs> I wish I could show you guns. Yeah, I got to make a have done those guns. <laughs> But the one thing I want to take from that is communication and how important it is now, not just now, but every day, like how important is communication for you and for others to make sure that people just talk? It's so important, isn't it? Communication is really important. And I just encourage kids to, to sort of speak up. And, and there's a lot of ways you might not be as talkative as someone else, but find your voice, find mm -hmm. your voice and don't be afraid. What are they going to think? You know, you got to have your voice because the moment you come mute, you set yourself for for you, when you don't share, you set yourself up for being taken advantage of, different types of abuse. Things happen when you quiet. And the thing about it is that I, I just encourage him. I said, speak up. And you might not. I, like I said, I was a lot quieter than my, than my uh, twin brother. But uh, speaking up, I spoke up in a way that I, 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 I exude my, my, my talent and my gifts. And I, and I you know got on a, set on a platform of playing basketball, but I encourage kids yeah. that if you, for speaker, you can write. I, and I have over 20 journals that I've written in through the years and that when I was quiet, when I couldn't find my words to say, when I was a little bit timid, I wrote. And that was so therapeutic to me to write in the journal. And I was like, wow. And I might be feeling a certain way one day and I would write, you know, so I'm feeling, I'm feeling this kind of way because I don't know. And as I continue to write, I said, I know why I'm feeling this way. I may think about like, you know what, this is, you know, this is, you know, this made 10 years that my dad passed away or this whatever, you know, I know I'm feeling this way or I only got, you know, four hours of sleep last night, you know, but I, I, I tap yeah. into me and I, I and I, it's like it become a sound of voice. So I encourage kids all the time, like my, one of my books called Journey With Me, it's a journal that you write. This is so therapeutic and it's something that it does something internally for you. So you got to find a way to speak out, whether it's verbally speaking or it's writing, or maybe you could sing, or maybe you could do poetry, you know, yeah. I, I I do, uh, in my AIM High program, I do with girls, I get them to bring quotes. I said, yes, I want you to, let's, let's figure out what this one quote means. And they they love it for the girls that are sort of quiet and don't say much. I said, just tell me, yeah. it could be one word, what does it mean? So finding something that you have a voice that nobody has a right to say, you don't have a voice to speak up. And it might not disagree, it might not agree with what they've been saying, but please, and I tell my daughter, 11 years old, I said, I don't care if someone, it can be a grown up. In a respectful way, if someone tell you a hundred times that the sky is green, if you believe yeah. it's blue, say, I'm sorry, I, I appreciate your perception, but to me, the sky is blue. So I want her to still keep her voice and not ever lose her voice. Absolutely. Communication is so important on and off the course or on fields if we're talking about different sports. What other traits are really important, do you think, on and off the course? Uh, only not the core is that I think that you got to be, you got to sort of be uh, true to yourself. I, you know, I, it just really like, you know, sometimes you might pretend to a certain amount in front of people. You really got to be true to yourself. You gonna ever, you know, and it could be in the game. I know I used to watch video because I my basketball career was like I, I was behind the eight ball. I learned late how to play basketball. I, what I did in high school was just mere talent. When I got to college, I didn't know a lot of the terms. And so I learned late, so I was behind on my shooting. So so my point is that I, I had to watch video once I started playing with the national team. And I'm like, coach, you got to watch. Sometimes I watch some really ugly games.
but it was the only way I could become. If she had to just sugarcoat and say, you know what, are you okay? No, I wasn't okay. I'm looking at video like, oh my God, did I play defense like that? Like, what was I thinking about? Two for 11, like, oh my goodness, my shot was just so ugly. It was straight. I was leaning to one side. It was just a mess. So I watched video and I had to be true. The video don't lie. The video wasn't like, okay, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. I didn't box out. Yeah, that's me. So I encourage kids, especially athletes. I said, watch yourself. Okay. You'll say, oh, yeah, the coach is just messing with me. I know I play better than that. I know watch video. The video going to tell you the truth. So I would say be true to yourself. And, and, and there's a saying, I got to say this. I was saying my dad used to say, don't worry about what people say as long as it's not true. So if someone says something, you know what I'm saying again, don't worry about what people yeah. say as long as it's not true. If someone, so you don't have to worry about people judging you. Don't let people, see if I got some speakers, don't let people label you for different things. You're not good enough. You, uh, you're you yeah. dumb, you this and that. But when, when, when the coach told me I wasn't ready, that I was, you know, I wasn't a good player. I'm like, that was labeling me, but it was the truth. I had to fight my way back. I had to, yeah. I, you know, in life is not always where you're going, but it's how you get there. So definitely being true to myself and recognizing where I was helped me to build and go somewhere. So definitely being true to yourself. Say, you know what? Yeah, I got, I, I want to, I'm going somewhere. I want to get there in order for me to get there. I got to recognize that. Yeah, I got to, this this way is not, I, got, I might have to pivot in a different direction and get where I need to go. But you, if you, if you start lying to yourself, and it's gonna it's gonna stalk you. It's gonna uh it's gonna distort your your process. Absolutely, and those key points there are so important for any leader. Is there any leaders at the minute that you look up to? Your your mom and dad aside, is there anyone out there who do a really good job being a leader and leading people like in schools or in teams? Yourself being one of them. You know, I, I you know I consider myself. I've I've done a lot of presentation on leadership, and I. Yeah, I, it's funny. I said, man, I would have never thought as a little girl that I would even know anything about leadership. That I would be speaking on leadership, but but my type of leadership might be different. Is it leading by example? Like I, when I was yeah. in the military, first lieutenant, and I look and I try to identify on the teams I played the morale of the team. And matter of fact, I'm working on a DVD, and one of the topics is going to be leadership and understanding your role as a leader, and that it might not be that boss. And look at me, I'm on top of the mountain. You do what I say, as I do. You know, someone that demanding like yeah. that. But I was one to say that, you know what, I don't have to be in the front, but I want to help us get there. We're in this race together. And so, I, and I and I look at them, Rail, I don't remember Cheryl Swoops. And, and then uh, she she was, you know, just obviously an amazing player, three-time Olympian. She won WBA Championship College. She was just an amazing player. And I know sometimes I said, Cheryl, I remember, I was like, Cheryl, we were roommates a lot. And I was like, are you okay? Why you ask? I said, you don't seem like you yourself today. And she was like, oh, you know, she was sharing with me. She said, you know what, thank you for asking. You know, noticing that, and then some of the other players I would ask, and I was always looking at that. And so that type of leader that that I was, but I want to share a leadership role about one of my teammates that, Dawn Staley. I, I man, she just man, her leadership was just amazing. Was just uh, just it was just on a scale of ten, from zero to ten being great. She was just yeah, uh, awesome. And and I say that because. I, I, you know, I played with uh, Dawn State, which is a, a quarterback of the team, like a leader, and I'm already restricted. Yeah. Like, most of my big shots, she passed me the ball. Okay, this one yeah. particular, we were we were getting ready for the uh, the Olympics in 2000, and we would pass some tournaments prior. And this one of one of those games, I was not shooting that well, and you know, but I played a lot because yeah. of my defense. But the coach was jerking me out if I miss a couple shots, and you know, and just like, okay, go back in the game. So Dawn would pass me the ball sometime, and I look at the Coach, or I be, you know, she came to me and she pulled my shirt. She said, Don't you ever, when I pass you the basketball, don't you ever look at the bench. Because guess what? She said, When you're <laughs> on my team, if you're on the court with me, I'm the leader. She said, I ain't taking nothing from the coach. This is their team. But when you're on the court with me, I'm the, I'm me. the team leader. I'm the coach. She said, If I, she said, if I pass you the ball, I want you to shoot. Because guess what, Ruthie? If you shoot, there's a good chance you're going to make it. I'm like, Okay. And so, yeah. I really relaxed me and I, I made my next big shots and matter of fact my shot won the game we were playing the Russians and because she did that because she showed that leadership and she showed that initiative it it would it gave me this confidence and so I'm not surprised so I, I sent her a text and I sent a picture I always brag about how pretty her hair is I said one uh I want your hair and two I said Dawn I said I'm not surprised that you're gonna be our next Olympic coach I'm not surprised you won the national championship with South Carolina because your leadership 
and how you displayed on the basketball court were just amazing. So when I talked to teams, I was like, what's a playmaker? What's a point, a point guard? I said, no, you're a playmaker. You make plays. And it's a tough, it's a tough position, but it, at that leadership role on the court is just amazing. And, um, and off the court, I want to say someone that showed, and it's someone in the past, I, I have to say something about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I, I have to, and I know we're doing yep. more girls in sports. You, you, want me to, you want me to say more about female? Or, or, or just no, more? you say whatever comes to you, Ruthie. Go for it. But I, I would say definitely Dawn on the court. And of course, Teresa Edwards was a leader. Um, you know, I think um, off the court, I, I'm just going to just plug in since we just, this is uh, his holiday. And I, it just a leadership watching. I had some of my kids watching my my, my son, my, my daughter, and my son watching his his uh, I have a dream speech, and just so amazing. And I saw watch some of his other speech about what if uh what if I had sneeze. I watched one of his other street one of his other uh, speech about I don't know the name of it, but it, it was something like you might not always you know how we go on. So that's why I said the, the, the scary thing about setting goals. Oh my goal is I want to be a doctor. Okay. That's a, that's a lot of work and that's fine. And mm-hmm. set goals and believe it. But in the process, don't miss out on the opportunity to grow just because you wait and try to get that. Don't stand there and uh, dormant and not, not move it. He said, if, you mm-hmm. end up, if, you're, if you're a street sweeper, okay? That might not look yeah. good, but it's going to be, but be, sweep the streets like Maya Angelou wrote porn. Sweep the streets like Beethoven wrote music. You know, sweep the streets like yeah. Michael Angelou painted. He said, sweep the streets like you've never been sweet, swept before, that the heavens open up and say, you're the best street sweeper in, in the world. So don't miss out on the opportunity to grow. So in a way, just watching him and has his, I think he was way behind, beyond his time. And to have someone like that to really display leadership and just really instill, because I think leadership is just instilling, is a being example and being humble and someone that is like, meet people where they are and, and, and not being yeah. critical. But someone said, you know, and that's what I feel like great leaders are. Yeah, 100%. I want to talk to you, Ruthie, about the T-shirt you're wearing and the WNBA, her time to play. So we know that um, girls are dropping out of sport at the age of 14, twice as much as the boys. So I want to ask you, how can we keep girls in sport, in basketball, any sport? And tell me a bit about the Her Time to Play program. Wow, well, you know, I've been I've been overseas for at least 10 years for U.S. Embassy doing different, partnering with the NBA doing different girls, going to our clinics and, you know, Bangladesh, Papua New Guinea, you know, Africa, you know, Russia. And, uh, and uh, the last one we were with, uh, that we were in um, two different play, uh, uh, Kosovo. And that was just, I, I think it was the thing, it was her world, her game, let me see. Her world, her rules? Her world, her rules, man. It was, listen, I got some amazing pictures. We went to like seven different schools and at every school we got, we made them a color shirt, orange, blue, green. It yeah. was just so special. These girls to be in this atmosphere and to edify these young ladies. Say, you know what? Hey, I'm, I, you know, I would, when I would talk to them, I said, listen, look around, look to your left, look to your right. Who do you see? Not but girls. I said, and Adrian was only a uh, boy. Or anyway, I said, isn't it awesome? Just girls. I said, this is your time to shine. I said, nothing. I said, I got a twin brother. I ain't got taking nothing from the boys, but this is our time. I said, this is your world. This is your time. And I said, it's not being arrogant. It's not trying to say I'm better than you, but it's I, I, I have a place in this society. I have a place in this game. This game could be mine too. You know, and so I, and they were just, oh, you're excited. So we would have flexed our muscles. You know what? I, I, I have loved playing the game, but to be able to be part of uh, the legacy of really instilling these young ladies and edifying them and letting them know that this is, they need people like us say, you know, I give you permission to so I give you permission to shine. I give you permission to say, yeah, this is my time. This is my season. So it was just beautiful. And, and I loved it, taking pictures. We took pictures around feet. And it just, to me, I, that's what it's all about. And the girls, I think we have to give them something. It has to be bigger than the game. Yeah. It, some of those players could, could barely shoot a layup. Some of them not going to make it to the WNBA. That's real. And I told them, I said, some of you won't. I said, but the fact that this ain't about, I said, what we're doing is just not about basketball. And that's what you got to do. You got to give them, you got to teach them how to win. There's more than one way to win. And that's how you get them again, using basketball as a platform to, to look at me, to, they can have goals. Like, I don't care if we spend 30 minutes on layups. I'm not trying to teach you how to dribble between your leg, two balls behind the back. If you can't dribble straight line to the basket. No, we'll spend 30 minutes on dribbling, making layups. And to me, to, so you can feel accomplished because you do too much. They feel like, why am I playing? I'm not good. But I want you to know that you got to make it a process and you got to say, you know what? 
I don't want you to quit. I don't care how many shots you make. You can miss 10 layups. I don't care. What I want you to do is not quit. So now you're building up the confidence and you say, you know what, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm on a team and maybe I didn't score any points, but there's another way I can score. There's another way I can win. There's another way I can help my teammates. Because sometimes coaches just focus on the superstars. They, you know, the players that are talented and they yeah. always don't matter. No, there's a, there, there's a saying that you're as strong as your weakest link. So we got to come together. We got to, you know, especially at the girls' age, we got to say, hey, we can be true and honest, but we got to make it an experience. Yeah. We got to make it something that I want you to be able to talk about this 10 years from now with your friends, you know, and that's a definite not with your daughters because you're too young. But talk about this one day. Say, I played with the junior NBA, and it was amazing. Okay, yeah, we were two a team, but guess what? I met some great friends. I learned a lot about myself. You know, so I, I, I just believe that it has to create this, that we have to put emphasis on character. We have to put emphasis on self-awareness. We have to put yeah. emphasis on how can I be the best version of me in this setting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we need we need programs, like her time to say. We need to get Ruthie Bolton over to Ireland. Hey. I invited you before this. I'm inviting you again on the camera. Hey, say, say it again in case they, you're not recording. Say it again. Speak yeah, up. Yeah, you're say coming it. over to Ireland. The I'm minute coming, we I, can get you over, get you over. I hope, I hope we, you uh, have heard that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But in 2018, um, we introduced in basketball Ireland the junior NBA program. So it was where schools got teamed up with clubs. They played basketball from the age of 11 to 13, and it culminated into a festival of basketball basically in the national basketball arena in dublin here right where we've had over two thousand kids play and they loved it because they were so young it was competitive non-competitive it got them in there and i just think it's really important that we get kids at a really young age and grab yes. their attention with any sport if it's basketball or any sport i think that's vital isn't it yeah it's so important and i you know i you know my daughter plays and everybody said your daughter play you know she plays she's not crazy about it i said listen I'm not going to force my daughter to play basketball, but I yeah. want her doing something. She danced, and actually she's starting to say, now, Mom, I think I want to play. I, I won't go force. I said, as long as you got a good attitude and you can do three sets of 10 push-ups, uh, by the time you, uh, you know, 11, I'll wait, because I put emphasis on push-ups, but it's, it's, it's <laughs> a, the mind thing. It's a flexing your muscles from the inside, because I, I want her to be a fighter. I don't want you to be afraid to fail. I don't want you to be afraid that I might mess up. I don't want you to be afraid that I might miss a shot. Cause yeah, you're gonna miss a lot, but you you can you can make more. And so, but yeah. we definitely got to instill in them like, hey, you know what? This is your time. The game, you know. I I, I we had a program. My, my sisters rebuilding lives through sports. Sports is the most beautiful beautiful thing. It's the way to bridge the gap between countries and people. It is a uni it's a uh, it's a universal universal language, and and I love it. And and so so we definitely have to put emphasis on. Like, hey, it's okay you're not a superstar. And because everybody, they feel like they're not important, feeling inadequate, you know? No, it doesn't matter. You got somebody scoring 25 points, you scoring two. No, there's a place for you. And so I think if we have to put emphasis on that so they can feel, and that's what I enjoy doing. That's what that, when I was over in our constable, that's what I feel. And I wanted to go back and see those girls. It's like, hey, I'm going to come back. And I'm because I want you to know you matter in, in spite of what happened. You matter because you're out here. That's yep. why you matter. Like, and there's so many different ways of expressing themselves. If it's like your daughter with dancing, or if it is in sports, you can be a volunteer, you can be a coach, you can be a referee, you can be a table official. And it's a family as well, you know? Um, that's great. So we have sources that you're going to come over to Ireland. I'm happy with that. Um, so we've two more sessions left to interview, Ruthie, right? So I want to switch it to resilience, character building, and mental health, right? And you've touched on it already that your dad, he instilled three principles in your life so it was faith attitude and character tell me a bit more about those i know you touched on them but how important were those three principles for you well those three principles that my dad taught me that he would say over and over and over your faith and 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 not trying to beat people across here the bible your faith is something bigger than you uh we go up we grew up baptist you know and i have friends catholic i have friends different religion it don't matter but uh but your faith something that we are here for a reason my faith is that my foundation is my faith because it, it's, it's not about how rich you are. You know, you, we all know some stories. You know, people got many, they got materialistic thing. They, they got money they can burn and they still don't 
have something on the inside. So I think having faith, something that bigger than me, like this is not just about me. And so faith is so important because there's a saying to the world, you might be one person, to one person, you might be the world. And also that your gifts, the Bible did say your gifts will put you before a great man. So understand that what we're doing is bigger than us. Faith, attitude is your mindset. And your mindset is that every situation you approach, like I say, every day I wake up, I'm thinking like, okay, how can I be better today? How can I be productive? How can I, how can I bring light to someone else's life? And the attitude, the mindset. So I'm not dictating my, my attitude on things that happen. Oh my God, if you really knew like what my life, what I'm going through, like things I go through, you would, people like, I, I just, I can't look like my situation. I don't have to look like my situation and what I'm going through. So my mindset is that I'm not going to let anything take my joy, steal my joy, because I will be giving my power away. And I, I wrote a journal called Keep Your Mighty Power, and it's a writing journal for girls. And I'm like, hey, I don't care whatever you do, don't let someone take your power. So that's a mindset is that, you know what, I'm going to be the best version of me. Whatever else happens, happens. And that's a quote, mm -hmm. that life is 10% of what happens to you, 90% how you respond to it. I'm going to say it again. Life is 10% of what happens to you, 90% how you respond to it. My father put that on every door in the house. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking like, okay, it's green on this door. It's red on this door. It's yellow <laughs> on this door. Like, what's the big deal? It's the same thing. Like, seriously. Like, I'm like, dad, are you for real? Like, but my dad wanted us to get that embedded here and here. Because he said, yeah. daughter, he said, daughter, and that's what he called me most of the time because he couldn't remember my name. You know, we're 12 girls. <laughs> he said, daughter, if you can get this, not just memorize, but get it in your heart. He said, because you're going to need this. As you embrace this real world, life attempts will happen to you. And sure enough, I've had to use it. I've kept that in my pocket. I keep it around my neck. That life attempts will happen to you. Now I'm sure how you respond to it. And that's attitude and that's mindset. And then character. It's your actions, okay? And, and I share this when I speak to kids and I think about everything source in the mind. Your thoughts, let's see if I get this right. Your thoughts become your words. Your words yeah. become actions. Your action becomes your uh, habits. And your habits become your character. And guess yeah. what? Your character so determines your destiny. And your character determines your destiny. So your character, your actions, and only your actions. You know, I say, yeah, when I, when I say only where you are, like when I will, you know, I was, I, I, I own my, who, who I am. And I, I just, that's just me. I don't like, I will watch film and I might've had a pretty good game, defensive game. And I'll watch film and like, you know what? Man, I let that girl got by me twice. She may get by one of my other teammates six, seven times. It won't phase in, but me, and I'm like, oh man, if she hadn't got by me, maybe Lisa Leslie wouldn't have had to foul out to, to try to yeah. block her shot. And so I always own my flaws, my, my flaws, and just like, I want to be better. I learned my daughter, when she, I remember her telling me at seven years old, I think she said, I was talking to her, but I was talking too loud. She said, Mommy, can you just talk to me in a better tone? I was like, oops. <laughs> yes. I hope you, I'm so sorry. And I was, mom, I was frustrated about something else. And I, but I can learn. I'm not too proud to say with my actions, owning your action to me, that's what builds characters that, you know what, this is where I'm at, this is where I want to go. And your character embodies who you are. And check this out. Your character, not always when people look in your character, what, but you do behind closed doors. Because your character going to find you out. Your character going to show. It will show eventually the kind of character that you have. 100%. I think if anyone gets anything from this interview, it's those three principles that they can take throughout every way of life. Faith, guess character, what? attitude. And guess what? Those yeah. three things. It doesn't matter to matter your status. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter. It's not an economical status. It is like those three things that if you don't have pockets to put them in, you can put them around your neck. Those three things that if you keep as your pillows, it, it, it is just, I think about, and, I, and one of the reasons I'm so adamant, I'm so like, because my dad, I remember my dad telling me all this stuff and sharing all this stuff. And I'm thinking like, hmm, when I was going through my challenges and when I was, just trying to decide on should I get on that bus to go to Auburn and my dad said oh you got this get on that bus to go to Auburn you got this I'm thinking like okay he said I believe in you you're gonna get there you're gonna prove to him I'm thinking yeah my dad said mm -hmm, that's what dads do oh uh, he trying to cheer me up okay he trying to cheer her up his daughter I'm thinking like there's no way if I'm going a school they already showed me they don't really want me they put yes, my, this, this they, they my sister on a private jet and they put yeah. me on a bus to go there 
And I'm thinking like, I'm sitting on the bus for 10 hours going to Armour. Yeah. 10 hours and I get there and the coach tells me, wow, they were shocked that I even came. They didn't think yeah. that I would even come because 10 hours on the bus and my sister on a private jet, I should have known then that I wasn't as much of a value in their eyes. And, and I was like, but I did, but my dad encouraged me to go. My dad said, listen, don't, don't give your power away by not going. Cause you'll look back years from now and say, you know what? I blame Auburn. But he said, no, you cannot. Cause guess what? If a door closed, find a window to get through. That's part of your action. That's part of saying, I'm not going to take no for an answer. So I, so I went on to Auburn and I ended up, obviously the rest is history, but had I not gotten on that bus, yeah. then I, I would not have been able to experience the things I have. And, and, and fear scares us. And we some we don't want to fail, you know. But I'm glad that my dad just kept nudging me, say, "Hey, you got this. There's something inside of you. I'm just I'm just here to remind you that you got what it takes." But this, this it, 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 it would have been so easy for you. Your sister Mayola is it your sister's name Mayola? Yes, she was getting recruitment officers offers left, right, and center, and you just jumped on a bus for ten hours and like what? What was the resilience piece there like for you? Because yeah, you I mean, were going, knowing they didn't want you. Yeah, I had a feeling, but I still had to have my conversation. And when I had my conversation yeah. with them, because they promised my parents, I had to go home and think about this for a week. I can remember them driving me home, and I'm just, I'm devastated. I'm like, man, my life is over. I'm I've been a good girl. I've gone to church. I don't, I don't try to start fights with anybody. I listen to my parents. You know, I eat my I eat my vegetables. You know, I have to figure out like why is my life turning upside down? Like, oh my goodness! And I was like, and my when I got home, my dad said, he said, this is what he told me is what's inside that counts. He said, don't worry about what people say as long as it's not true. He said, if you don't show back up, you're gonna be telling them what they saying about you is true that you're not good yeah. enough. You never make the travel team. He said, don't let people label you like that. Don't give your power away. He said, you got this. And I'm thinking, he said, I think you should go. He said, but it's your decision. So mm -hmm. I chose to go back, not knowing if I would play at all. But I knew, you know, what it created, and I might be going to our other subject, but I didn't know if I would play. I knew I had this sense of urgency. In my DVD that I'm doing, too, is about, you know, as I'm saying, you know about, I'm, I'm going to ask you, you heard it saying about don't put all your eggs in one basket? I do, indeed. Hey, yeah. listen, you ain't got but one basket, guess what? You put every egg you got. When you got yeah. one basket right there, it's a sense of urgency. It is like, I have no room for error. This is it or never. I put every egg I had in that basket when I got to Auburn. Yeah. If the coach said do 20 push-ups, guess what I did 30. If we did yeah. a sprint and he wanted us to be done in 10 seconds, I got done in eight. I was trying to exceed expectations because I didn't want to leave any room for error. And that drive inside of me is like, I can't. So that sense of urgency it 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 uh it pushed me forward, and so and and that's what really helped me become this fight. I wanted so bad. That's what I'm saying too. Knowing your why, when you lose your why, yeah. you lose your way. And knowing what your why is, I want this. And so what? If if you and I tell the young people, if you fall flat on your face, you gotta say it's okay. It's okay to fall flat on your face because guess what? You being young, you get back up. And guess what? I said, if you fall flat on your face again, you get back up. And I, and I would tell the kids that one of my speeches, uh, presentation I had, permission slips. That is what's inside that counts. That to the world, you might be one person. I had that quote and on the had bottom per, per, permission slip. I give you permission to soar. I give you permission to fail. I give you permission to, to come up short, but you never know if you don't go. The yeah. Blah, blah. I think we, we're all too afraid of failing though. Like. It I is. wouldn't want to put all my eggs in one basket. I want a plan B in case it doesn't work. But then you're saying if you want something bad enough, you actually have to put all your eggs in one basket. So like that's interesting for people listening that they might go, okay, actually, I really want this. So I'm actually going to go and get it. Because guess what? When you got plan B, and I, and I do plan B, I'm very flexible. You know, to be successful, yeah. you got to have some flexibility. Because in a game, you draw out a play. And I'll play. Yeah. How often does a play go like exactly how you want? I said, I think it's 70% of the time it doesn't. So yeah. if you got a play where I need to drive straight to the basket, that might not happen. But guess what? I gotta pull, I got I might have to pull up for a shot. Or I might have to get a screen. So there's a more than one way to score and win. But there's a time when the clock is down, the clock is running down. The clock is like you ain't got a chance for one more play. It ain't no plan B. 
It is a sense mm -hmm. of urgency. It's like right now, I got to do it right now. So when I was going to Auburn, no other schools wanted me. So I can sit back and say, okay, well, I guess I'm going to hope somebody call me. I'm going to hope somebody. No, no, it is now. I, yeah. I embrace this opportunity now or I stay at the house or I do my or I do my other career. I sing or I'd be a nurse, but basketball wasn't going to be it. I wanted to play so bad. And I'm like, how can someone that plays state, won state twice, was averaging about 25 points a game, how can mm -hmm. I not get a scholarship? How can I not go to college and play basketball? I'm like, I know I had a bad gym curve. I'm like, is it that bad? I think, <laughs> I'm like, what, what the world, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, your hair is your hair is class. Crazy. class. I need to put a no, rose right. Right. No, it's <laughs> so good. Um, Ruthie, has there been any other challenges that you've had to overcome in life then? I just want to give people an idea of any other challenges and what's your advice for young girls and boys who may be going through challenges now, whether it be in school or adults at work or in just in life in general, what would you say to them? I'm gonna say another challenge that might happen is injuries. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Sports. And I want to say too, for for the ones that watch, and I, I talked to some athletes last night, and I'm actually going to a game tonight. And I share with them during this pandemic. Listen, I, I I want you to rise above. I said during this time that you're waiting, I said don't just. I said if you tell yourself that this the worst year is going to be the worst year, find something to do. If you got a basketball at home and and you're not able to practice that much, practice on your ball handling at home. Work on your push up, getting your strength. Working on your core. Do something you could do. I said, there is something that you can do even during this during this time. And I said, please don't. I said, there's a there's a quote. We miss out on opportunities because they come in work clothes. I said, don't miss out on the opportunity to grow because, well, it's not like it used to be. I'm going to give up. I said, because that's easy to do. Oh, yeah, I'm going to give up more away. That's easy. But what's going to show your true character? I know we talked about character uh, earlier. It's about how you fight, how you maneuver through, how you find uh find a way. I tore my ACL late in my career. I had probably one of the best game of my life. And I watched this game like two months ago, the world championship game. Oh, I got to tell Adrian, he got to see it. Oh my goodness. In 98 in Germany, the world championship, we played the Russians. They had our number. Cause we had won in 96. We had won. You know, we, we took the world by storm in 96 Olympics and 98. I'm like, shoot, we're in somebody else's backyard now. Can we do it? The pressure was on. The Russians had our number. We was about, we were down 12, 13, I think 13 and 14 and a half. We just could not really get in our rhythm, our groove. They played us this weird defense. And we were just like, oh my God, we were just like um, uh, like in this weird place. And I remember sitting down with about four minutes left to go. And I tell my coach, I never do this. I, I, I feel like I'm probably one of the best team players in the world. Like I, if the coach play me 30 minutes or she don't play me none. I'm not going to question the coach. I'm going to trust my leadership. And so I remember tapping the coach. Like, I got to go back in the game. She was like, <laughs> what? That was assistant coach. She put me back in in the World Championship game. Dawn State was, she was the point guard. I hit two big shots, like down the stretch. Me and Dawn State and Lisa Leslie scored 16 points, just us in the last. We beat them by like four or five points. And when I watched that game like two months ago, I'm like, oh my God. It was so exciting. Like, I knew the outcome, but I was still like, oh, my God, look at this game. So my point is, I was on cloud nine. We had just beaten the Russians, and it was so exciting. I go back to my WNBA team, and the fifth game of the season, I, I told my, I tell my ACL, oh, my goodness. And I'm, I'm like on cloud nine, but now I'm actually just devastated. I told my ACL. I was like, nightmare. And I'm, and I'm 33. Okay, that started old in basketball. I'm 33 years old, and I'm just like, oh my god, how could this happen? So, and I now I'm now I can, I gotta I gotta act I gotta speak instead I gotta talk this thing out now I gotta pray this thing out and I've been talking about attitude now I gotta really talk don't talk about it be about it and so I started working my butt off and and I was like man well I heard I was seeing rumors that I should I retire and I was thinking yeah I won I won a gold medal in the Olympics and the World Championship in the good way I had played like eight national teams. I'm like, I got to had a pretty good career. I'm like, I'm, I think I'm going to just transition to something else. And guess what? I heard, it was in the papers that I hope Ruthie Bolton not thinking about coming back because she's too old and rusty. What did I uh -oh. hear that? I was like, uh-oh, watch out now. This game on, game on, baby. <laughs> Listen, I started working harder. I started going to swim class and getting back. I said, I'm getting back. And I worked my butt off and I ended up, I came back 
I made an all-star team for the WNBA the following year. I'm talking about this injury. Eric Hyden was a five-time gold medalist in skin, and he was a doctor. People didn't know that. He was my surgeon. He was in that skate show. They'd be going around the curves. Yeah, yeah. He, he said, not just any athlete, a hundred of the world's best athletes now. Not just everybody say, okay, I play sport. A hundred of the world intense, gritty, only 10% of them will come back from that injury that I had. My knee was like, they didn't think I would ever even almost not walk again. I came back and made the Olympic team. I made, I made an all-star team in the Olympic team. That was just tenacity, grit. And yeah, it was hard to, see the, to hear those people say those things, but I use it to elevate me. So I tell kids, I tell youth, adversity, I say it's the most beautiful portrait in the world. Mm. It's to watch someone say, you know, I watch my work. It's to use something negative and use it to elevate you. And I share with them, I said, please, I'm telling you. I said, if you decide you're just not going to do it, if I decide, you know what, yeah, I'm good. But if you want something, you got this burning desire in you, I said, I'm telling you, you got to go for it. Because guess what? Most of the time, you're going to, I said, you're going to, you want to feel like I'm, I didn't stop because of fear or because they said I wasn't good enough. So that type, I said, it hurts. And you don't like being rejected. You don't like being ridiculed. But I'm telling you, tap into you. There's something yeah. waiting for you. Your inside said, please come. I'm here. Something inside as you say, I want you to know that you got this. Yeah. Right, I'm going to say this real quick. I'm just in Puerto Rico, a little boy. Oh my God, it makes me tear up. It was, um, let me see, what's his name? I'm thinking his name was it. Tom, he was just so adorable. He was about 10 years old. My eyes got wore. I was thinking about it. His, his mom said, I want you to talk to him. And he was just sitting there. He was looking. He was sort of quiet. And I said, what's up, little guy? And, and he was just really shy. I hurt my ankle. And he was, because his, he he was a skier. I'm not a skier, so a surfer. Surf, uh, he uh, surf. And yeah. uh, his teacher had gotten killed six Month, six weeks prior, and he he did he was one missing him, and two he got injured, and so now it just like all these double things that make him feel like he he gonna worry he's not being noticed now is he gonna ever make it back from his injury all these different things in a little ten year old here I said listen, then I told myself I had an injury too, and that one time I felt like man I feel like I'm missing out I see everybody else doing everything else I said but during this time when I shifted my mind I said what can I do while I'm sitting here grow learn. I said, read, study. I said, catch up on your schoolwork. I said, well, you, the leg going to heal. I said, trust me. This is just, a, I said, minor what you're going to do. I said, I'm telling you. I said, you, and you don't want your mom worried about you. Your mom got a lot of stuff to do. So I said, what you do every day, I want you to get up. I want you to look in the mirror. And I, I said, I want you to, I said, I want you to put your hand right here. Know your heart. You got a heartbeat? Oh, it's a great day. Then I said, I want you to play. <laughs> I said, when your mom saw saying, I said, mommy, I got this. And so he was like, so his mom texted me. Later, I gave him my number. In Puerto Rico, I gave him my number. And she said, I want you to know uh, my son says he got this. And it was just this. so, you know, it's like letting them know that it doesn't matter the adversity, the challenges. They're just shaping you into something even better. I look at my life, all the things. I, I could have stopped at so many. I had so many crossroads, so many detours. But look at what happened, the fact that I didn't get up and go away. That those hard times, I just said, wait. Okay, tap into you, Ruthie. Tap into that inner source. You got this. Tap into that faith. Tap into that mindset. Tap into that character. My action. What am I going to do about this? And I said, you got this. And so, and I said, because it's what's inside the council. And to me, that helped me. And so that's what I want the young people to know. Don't let, don't, please get over that fence. Don't let that fence yeah. overwhelm you. There's something on the other side. And that's what it's all about. Letting them know there is something be true to what I'm feeling. Journal, journal say, I, I, I feel horrible. This sucks, whatever, whatever. But you know what? There is an other side, and I'm going to get yeah. to that other side. Oh, earphone. No, absolutely. And finally, Ruthie, in terms of, you speak a lot about your, your inner mind and your inner self and how you are such a driver for yourself and self-motivator, which is amazing. But I think with your father and your friendships and the different relationships in your life, they've got you where you are today as well so I, I wanted to touch on how important are those relationships in your life now like your relationship with your daughter and that like how important are they now and friendships you know, like how the important relationship, is that? The, the relationship is and I think having you know I, I guess coming from a big family you know my family was you know we was all friends and you know we we got along really well my dad made sure that I couldn't even call my brother stupid I couldn't even call 
I, we could call our siblings out their name. My dad didn't, didn't allow it. So we actually were well, family within the separate friends. But, uh, but as I've gotten older, having someone you can trust, someone that you don't have to go through tough times by, your, uh, by yourself and find it. It may not be a lot. It may be one or two that you can trust, that you can be able to bounce things off or build it. And a lot of times you hear people say, I don't need nobody. I can be by myself. But you're going to become a prisoner of your own emotions. And I think I don't think it's healthy. You can be uh, alone, but not necessarily lonely. So that's time you need. Because I get my me time. My me time is when I work out. But I love friends. I yeah. love having I love, I think sometimes getting out yourself, I love learning what other people manifesto is. I, I would tell my friend the other day, I said, if I get on a plane with somebody, if they send by me, and I hope they ain't planning on sleeping too long. Cause before, hey, listen, they going to find, <laughs> they going to know what my manifesto is. I'm going to know what theirs are before we get to the end. Because my teammates, they used to see me sitting by somebody, they say, you know what, you in trouble sitting by her. They were like, why? She she don't know how to go. She talks all the time. She don't know how to go to sleep because she's from a family of 20. She always full of conversation. And so they were like, I will be okay. But but I, I think just creating relationships and I is so important yeah. because it, it, it's I think it's healthy and uh having yeah. friends and, and someone accountability, having someone to hold you accountable, say, you know what? That is crucial. That that is imperative to find someone that you could trust some information with because you can't carry everything by yourself. Yeah, so teamwork is so important, and there's so many teams in school and life and work. When you were first lieutenant in the army, what was that like? Uh, lieutenant in the army, uh, the military was just amazing. I went, I went just because my sister wanted me to go. Uh, my sister wanted me to go with her to the military because she wanted to get some pants and cut them off to some shorts. I was like, okay. And I was like her little sister. Like she cooked for me, cleaned for me. And she was like my mom, she was in college. And so she was like, I think I'm gonna go to the military. I heard they give you can make $600 in like six weeks. And, and she's like, I can get a lot of those pants. I was like, cool, let's go. And I went and she hated it. She was like, oh my God, I don't want their pants. I ain't, I don't want nothing to do with the military. So I went in and stayed because I, it started to help me build my confidence. I got, I didn't think I could, I'm, I'm very, I was afraid of water. They did exercises where I'm like, they said, you're going to do this by the, you're going, by the end of the day, you're going to learn how to j- climb up this 40 foot pole and walk out and drop off in water. I said, good luck. I know I'm not. Before you knew it, I was doing it. They said, you're going to climb this wall and, and repel down. I don't like heights. I'm not doing it. But I found myself doing all the things I said I could do. I'm like, if I just pause for a second and tap into me, me is trying to tell me I got you. But I'm trying yeah. to tell me that I'm afraid. And like, so definitely the military gave me a broader scope of teamwork. It helped me with my individual uh, and it's also with my team. And it's like, the, you're as strong as your weakest link. I said it earlier, you're as strong as your weakest link. And I love that part of a team. And the little, the little stint that I coached, I coached about five years at a Christian college. And I, I was big on teamwork. One of my players was one of my probably tallest and best players. I remember yep. uh, I took her, she didn't give her one teammate high five coming out the game. And I didn't even start the second half. Well, and so I said, you know what? I don't, I would not condone that type of stuff. No, I don't care how good you are. I won't do it. And matter of fact, no, it was my seventh grade boys team. I had heard that this young man was uh, causing havoc. He was bullying his, because he was a small skilled one. He was messing with the other ones. Like, you ain't going to play. You're not that good. You know, kids going to be kids. I sort of ignored it. And I, you know, and I started hearing it more and finally in the game. It, ironically, the kid was coming out for him. He, he literally put his hand behind his back. I was like, okay, I got something for that. I didn't put him back in the second half. And, and he was looking all at me during the game, after the game. I said, you got something you want to say? He said, why didn't I play? I said, I want you to go get your parents. I want, I want, we all going to have a conversation. I said, yeah. y'all probably one of the best players. I said, you're the most skilled player on the team. You probably play at least 25, 30 minutes a game. And I'm going to be honest. I had heard that you was bullying such and such. I ain't going to say the name. You bullying such, you know. I said, but the bottom line is that kids going to be kids. I ignored it, but I kept hearing it. I saw for myself, you came out of the game, you didn't give him high five. That, I would not tolerate that zero because guess what? Mm. We are a team. What, what is our thing? We're a team, we're a family. We're a team, we're a family. Because I said, I, this ain't just about basketball. I can lose 10 games in a row. If I condone that actress, I'm not helping you. I said, the, uh, teamwork made the dream work. We all here dr- dreaming, we, we want something. So it's about being part of a team of family. I said, you can't do that. I said, you are so talented. I said, you are so talented, but you can't. That kind of stuff you can't do. And he was like, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. From that day on, had no problem with him. 
Matter of fact, we won a championship that year because he finally became his team player, high five his teammates, yeah. and showing some ability. So teamwork is huge. That has been, if you got a hundred players that know me, and they had, if you had to write one word, they won't say teamwork. Teamwork. My, 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 and I have to share this story. Teamwork. There's trust. Become part of a team. You got to trust each other. They got to trust you. And my college, my Olympic coach. I have to say this. When we were yep. around the, uh, I don't even know if Adrian know this. Right after they picked the Olympic team, we were pretty much solidified. But you, they could always change their mind. They could always make a change if you, you know, if you do something out of integrity or whatever. She named everybody on the team. She said, Lisa Leslie, you're on this team because of your size, your scoring ability, and your, and your competitiveness. Katrina McLean, your leadership, your experience. Katrina McLean, your rebound ability. Kaya Smith, you know, you shoot the lights out. Nick and McCray, your defense is just on point. She named everybody. Jennifer Az, your stamina, your leadership. When she got to me, you know what she said? I asked the kids. I was like, what do you think the coach said about me? <laughs> And I'm thinking, I'm because I'm thinking like she's giving everything away to everybody else. I'm like, what's she gonna say about me? Is there, I'm like, she waiting for that. I'm like, coach, is there anything for me? Like, what about me? <laughs> she said, Ruthie. She said, I'm flat. I told the committee, I'm not leaving the country without Ruthie. I'm like, she said, Amazing. I can trust you in my foxhole. That's a military term. I can trust you in my foxhole. One of the biggest compliments a coach could ever give me. I was like, unreal. And my teammates made fun of me. Oh, I can trust you in my foxhole. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, you her favorite. I'm like, no, I'm like, she, I didn't, she just made, she just, she said, I told the committee that I'm not leaving the country without Ruthie because you need somebody like that, that you can trust them when they having a great game, a great day. You can trust them when maybe things not going their way. She knew that I was going to bring my A game on or off the court. She knew yeah. I was going to be that team player on and off the court. It's important. She knew I was going to, not jump out of character because, okay, I'm having a bad day, so I ain't going to be a great teammate. To me, that is crucial that your coach and your leader can trust you and to can trust you. And I'm not somebody to score. And it wasn't always scoring. There were games that I didn't even play much. She trusted me that I'm going to be that teammate. I'm going to encourage my teammates to say, hi, you got this. So that's what is the most amazing thing about teamwork and chemistry, that you're a family, you grow together, you cry together, and it just is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And finally, Ruthie, what's, finally. Your, what's your best piece of advice for anyone out there looking to chase their dreams, in your opinion? Oh, uh, the best advice chasing their dream. You've given us lots of advice now, to be fair, during this interview. But I said, one thing if, you you chase, to someone. if you're chasing your dreams, I want you to push, persevere, and I'm going to borrow one of Dr. Martin Luther King saying, we all want to fly. It's a beautiful thing to fly. But if we ain't flying yet, I want you to run as fast as you can. And if you ain't running yet, I want you to walk as fast as you can. And if you're not yeah. walking, I want you to crawl as fast as you can, as long as you keep moving. And that's moving your mindset. I ain't my, my, uh, my absolute program is called Attitude in Motion. Attitude in Motion, aim it high. Is that, hey, it's a new day. I got something I want to do. And I'm, my mind, it starts here. Whether you're trying to lose weight or whether you're trying to be a, a, a basketball player, and whether you try to do something academic, you may not even play sports. So if you out there listening to me, you might not play sports. I don't know. You may decide next tomorrow, I don't want to play. But this is not a basketball story, girls and boys. This is a life story. I want you to persevere. I want you to every day you get up out of bed and put your feet down, I want you to look in the mirror and look at yourself. And say, you know, who am I? Who am I? I get to choose. Who am I? I'm not going to let circumstance choose that. Put your hand on your heart. Say, you know what? Yes, yeah. I got a heartbeat. Also, in a nutshell, I want you to be the best version of you. Stretch yourself wide. There's nobody in the world with your fingerprint. Be the best version of you because I'm going to end with this quote. To the world, you might be one person, but to one person, guess what? You just might be the world. Ruthie, I don't think there's any other way to end this apart from that. You're not saying Except with this, baby. I wish I was showing the guns. Hey, yeah, up? I have nothing. Oh, I feel, it feels good to flex. It just, hey, you know what? It does something to the body when you flex. It's a positive thing when you think positive and you just say, you know what? I got this. It changed the whole chemistry of your body. There was a study that was done at Stanford. It's the way you think. It changes the whole uh, narrative of your body. And, you, and, and so I, 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 I refuse. My mindset every day is that I'm thinking positive. That don't mean everything going to go the way I want, but guess what? I can fall down and it just, it's a beautiful thing. 
is that I, I have already, hey, officer, you might want to get out of my way. So I look at everything and say, what's your fence? That's just how I got over that fence. Officer, you're not going to stop me. So the thing about it is that to the world, you might be one person, two in person, you be the world. And what is your fence? What is your fence? And have the mindset is that there's something on the other side and I'm going to get there. I might get delayed, yeah. but not denied. Well, I'll tell you, I'm feeling good. I hope everyone who watched this interview enjoyed it. And I think we'll all agree, Ruthie, absolute legend. And for Ramila Mahagut, I have to get that in there at the end. We have to get you to Ireland. And for Ramila Mahagut means thank you very much. So well, it's a show hey. for you. Oh, yes, I was going to ask you, did you have your Olympic medal? Oh, hey, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not done. I don't leave home without it. Look, my medals. So for you to see, hey, the Olympics, it's about a mindset, it's a spirit. When I travel and I show these and I let the kids uh, wear these, it, it's not to brag, but it's to say, hey, you know what? If I can do it, you can do it. I want you with that, that Olympic spirit, that Olympic drive. And that's why I take these and show them. Amazing. Pick them up so we can see them there, Ruthie. They are beautiful. At, at Atlanta and Sydney. Absolutely beautiful. Fair play to you. Ruthie, thank you so much. Cannot wait to get you over to Ireland. Next year is good. Anytime soon, so really. <laughs> yes, exactly. Let me know. I got my passport. It's good. <laughs>